We are continuing our series today on grace and uh, just kind of recap this series that the first week we covered the definition of grace and the definition we're working with during this series is this, is grace is God's favor shown to the undeserving. God's favor shown to the undeserving. Last week we talked about this uh, concept of common grace. And it's not common in terms of it being ordinary, it's common in terms of it being grace that God gives to everyone. And we ended last week by uh, reminding ourselves that God calls us to make sure that the people of the world don't miss the grace of God. Today, as we continue this series, we're talking about how grace is at work in each stage of our lives. And today, as we continue this series, I want to talk to you about something called prevenient grace. And we're going to go on and give you the definition, and then we're going to dive into it. Prevenient grace is the grace that God gives to us that precedes salvation. That precedes salvation. That word prevenient is not a word that we use very often. In fact, I remember when I was uh, in my theological class in college, uh, we was going through the, how grace is at work in each stage of our lives, and I came across this uh, word, and I'm like, what does that word mean? Well, prevenient literally means preceding. And so when we talk about prevenient grace, we're talking about the favor or the grace, the mercy, the love that God shows to us that precedes salvation. Ultimately, God gives this grace to everyone, and it's designed for everyone to lead to salvation. Now, you might be thinking today, why would I need to know about this grace that I guess I've already received because I am a follower of Jesus today, I have received salvation, I am saved, so why would I need to know about this grace? Well, it's because I don't think that we as Christians are as grateful as we should be for the grace that God has given to us. But even more than that, I think the reason why we're not as grateful as we should be is because we didn't really realize our state, the state of our lives without God's grace. We didn't realize and we don't still don't realize how powerless we really are. And therefore, I don't think we know just how much God loves us. See, this is a point that you're going to be hearing throughout the rest of the series, especially the week after Easter. It's this. Grace is essential because grace precedes any act of obedience to God. So in some ways, when we're talking about prevenient grace, the grace that precedes salvation, in many ways, grace precedes any act of obedience to God, not just saying yes to following him at salvation. When we get into the week after Easter talking about sanctifying grace, we're going to talk about how grace precedes any act of obedience that we as Christians do today. See, without grace, without God's favor, we couldn't do anything good for God. It's like this before we come to faith in Christ. It's like this after we come to faith in Christ. But today we're going to focus on before we come to faith in Christ before we ever respond to God in obedience by following him. We're going to talk about how this grace is at work so that we can respond obediently to his call to follow him. It is that prevenient grace. But for us to talk about this prevenient grace, we've got to first talk about our state without God's grace. So this is my next point. Yes, we're flying through, but that does not mean it's going to be a short sermon. Uh, Without God's grace... We are all spiritually dead because of our sin. Not just because of our sin, but because of sin, period. Without God's grace, we are all spiritually dead because of sin. In Ephesians chapter 2, this is kind of where we're going to be working out of today, although I'm going to be all over the place. But in Ephesians chapter 2, Paul is trying to communicate this, this concept to us. And he uses the images in our head of someone being dead and someone being alive. 
So he says in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, he's talking to the church, he's talking to Christians. He said, once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins, you used to live in sin, just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit that is at work in those who refuse to obey God. He says, all of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger, just like everyone else. See, Paul describes our state as dead. He says everyone was once dead. Now, of course, he's not talking about us being physically dead. He is talking about us being spiritually dead. And what he essentially saying here is that you can't do anything in your own power because without God's intervention, without God's help, it's as if you were dead. You know, you I was going, I was at my friend's church this past week, and we were in their uh, graveyard cemetery, and um, it was really, it was really uh, sobering to see um, even Civil War era graves, and even further back than that, to know that there's, that people have been laying there for years, and you know, as we talk about being spiritually dead today, um, when you're dead, you can't do anything. When you're physically dead, you can't do anything. Paul's wanting us to recognize that without God's grace, without God's intervention, we were all dead. As if we were lying in a coffin. As if we had no power, no life, no ability. And that's where God's grace comes in. That is why we need what is called this prevenient grace. That is why grace must precede any act of obedience to God. See, Paul is, is getting to hear a couple of theological terms that I want to introduce to you today. The first theological term is original sin. Original sin. Now, the original sin, that refers to the original sin committed by Adam and Eve. But that sin affects everyone. That sin affects everyone. See, the word for original actually means universal. And so when we talk about original sin, that is the first sin, yes, it was the original sin, but it is also the universal sin. And so I want to go through some things that happened because of Adam and Eve's sin. The first thing that happened because of Adam and Eve's sin is that we were all born into a sinful, fallen world full of temptation and things that point us away from God. So what Paul was getting at here in Romans chapter 5, verse 12. He said, when Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death. So death spread to everyone, for everyone sinned. He said, when Adam sinned, sin entered the world. The corrupting effects, the chaos that sin brings came into the world because of Adam's original sin. Now, if this world was as God intended to be, then everything in this world would actually point us to God, would point us to a saving knowledge of God. That's how God originally designed it to be. But because of Adam's original sin, he brought, he brought sin into the world, and so now... The world is full of temptations, the world is full of traps, the world is full of things that are ultimately designed not to point us to God, but point us away from God. To distract us from following God, which leads into this next part. Instead of us being born into a world where we get to walk with God, we get to live in his midst, instead we're born into a world where the enemy reigns, although with limited power. Going back to Ephesians 2, 2, that's what Paul was saying there. You used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, who is the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit that is at work today in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. 
Paul says that we were born into this world where, where the, the devil, our enemy, the one who desires for us to experience death, he is at work today trying to lead us to disobey God. And we fall prey to his power at work sometimes in our life because of Adam and Eve's sin. Because of that original sin, opening the door, basically, for sin and its corrupting effects to enter into our world. And we're also born into what's called a fallen state. Paul said this in Romans 5, 19, because one person disobeyed God, many became sinners. We are born, church, with a nature, and when I say nature, I mean the natural qualities or characteristics of a person that are part of us from birth. We are born with this natural quality, this natural characteristic, this natural desire to do wrong. Now, this is not how God originally designed us to be. And as I was doing my study this week, preparing for this, I came across something that kind of opened my eyes. Um, you know, when you think about it, all of us was in God's mind from the creation of the world. So I want you to just picture that. You were in God's mind from, from the creation of the world. When we read in Genesis 1, uh, when God created the world and what, everything he saw was good, he knew you were going to be created. And God designed all of us to be good. What God created was not bad. But what we have been taught through the scriptures and what the church has come to understand over the years is that because of Adam's sin, because of the original sin, you were born into a sinful, fallen world. So there's the world. You were born into a world that is sinful, that is fallen. And the fact that you got born into this world, let's put you, because you were born into this world, the world has a corrupting effect on you. Number one, you have things in the world that's leading you astray. Number two, you got the devil trying to lead you astray. But just the fact that you were born into this dark and dying world means that you were born with this nature that desires to do wrong. Your very nature has already been determined and even distorted away from what God designed it to be because of original sin. This gets into the theological concept of human depravity. And when I talk about human depravity, here's what I mean by that. It means that our nature is so corrupted because of the original sin that we instinctively do wrong. That we instinctively do wrong. Human beings are in such a depraved state because of Adam and Eve's original sin, that our nature, even though what God created was good, even though what, what God formed, each of you that God has formed, all of us that God has formed, we were created to be good, but because we are born into a sinful, fallen world, the world has already corrupted our nature. The word depraved means morally corrupt. We've, we are already morally corrupt because of the original sin. Elijah, our, our son that will be born here in a few months, he will be born with a corrupted, sinful nature. Do I think that's how God designed him? No. But because he was born into this world that's fallen, because of Adam and Eve's original sin, because we're not living in the world that God designed for us, his very nature, who he is, he will instinctively want to do wrong. He will instinctively desire to sin. And so when we talk about our uh, depraved state, when we talk about human beings being depraved, that depraved state that results from the original sin, it results in we have wrong desires. We desire the things of this world rather than God. It kind of got to that in verse 3. 
Paul said all of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. So because you have a sinful nature, because your nature has been corrupted, you have desires that are wrong. You have inclinations that lead you not closer to God, but away from God. He said this in Titus 3.3, 3, Once we too were foolish and disobedient. We were misled and we became slaves to the many lusts and pleasures. Our lives were full of evil and envy. And we hated each other. He says we were slaves to many lusts, to many pleasures, to things, to desires that were wrong. So because of our depraved state, because you were born into a sinful world, you have wrong desires. But also because you were born into a sinful world, you lost your freedom to decide. Keep that verse up there, Zach. Or whoever's back there. I can't see nobody. Uh, Paul says there that we were misled and we became slaves. Slaves can't do what they want. Slaves have to do what their master tells them to do. And so we were born into this state. We were born into this world with we were slaves to the things of this world and we were slaves to our sinful nature we couldn't choose to do right we can't choose to do right because we're slaves to that sinful nature we're slaves to that sin that that the world has in in grown in us basically and what paul says is that we are dead He's wanting us to understand you have no ability to get out of this yourself. Christians have traditionally taught that in ourselves, we don't have the freedom to say yes to God. Because we are slaves to our very nature, which is sinful. So you, and this is a concept I don't think we understand. Because we have experienced the freedom that comes with God. But if God didn't move on our behalf and God didn't give us grace, you could not even choose to obey him. You are so messed up. You are born so sinful that you automatically are going to do wrong. Also part of this depraved state is that our thoughts have been distorted. We are ignorant of God. That's what Paul says in Ephesians 4.18. He talks about the people of the world. He said they are darkened in their understanding. They are separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. He's talking about the people of the world in Romans 1.21. He says, yes, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship him as God or even give him thanks. And they begin to think up foolish ideas of what God was like, and as a result, their minds became dark and confused. So we're born ignorant of our Creator. We are born ignorant of our God. That's partially because you got the world trying to lead you astray, trying to distract you from God. But our very nature has designed us to be ignorant of God. To not even know that he exists, to especially not know he loves us. And because of our depraved state, it results in wickedness. We do wicked things. Romans 1, 28 through 31. Since they thought it foolish to acknowledge God, he abandoned them to their foolish thinking and let them do things that should never be done. Their lives became full of every kind of wickedness. Sin, greed, hate, envy, murder, quarreling deception malicious behavior gossip paul says they are backstabbers haters of god insolent proud and boastful they event, event new ways of sinning and they disobey their parents they refuse to understand they break their promises they are heartless and they have no mercy because of our depraved state because we are so messed up we just add more sinfulness to the world. Now, God didn't desire any of this for us. What God created in us was good. 
What God desired for human beings to be like, he desired for us to desire him, not the things of this world. He desired for us to live in a close relationship with him. He desired for us to add good to the world, to add good to other people's lives. He designed a perfect world for us to live in. It was good. But because of Adam and Eve's original sin, that was ruined for us all. Because of Adam and Eve's original sin, it corrupted God's good creation. So now we're born into this sinful world with a corrupted nature that desires to do wrong. And Paul says we are dead in our sins. and have no way of following him. But God, which is some of the most powerful words in all of Scripture. But God, because he loves us. He made a way for us to experience a taste of what he originally desired for us here on earth, but ultimately to experience what he originally desired for us the whole time with him in eternity. Paul says in Romans 5, 18 through 19, he says, yes, Adam's one sin, it brought condemnation for everyone. But Christ's one act of righteousness brings a right relationship with God and new life for everyone because one person disobeyed god many became sinners we just read that verse but there's a second part to that verse it says but because one person other person obeyed god many will be made righteous see here's here's the dilemma that we have now god has created a way for us to have life. So let's just put us over here somewhere. He has created a way for us to have life. He has given us this gift of life through sending his son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. He has created a way for us to experience the life he originally desired for us. But here we are over here according to paul dead in our sins dead because of sin to the point that we can experience that life in our own power we can experience that life because of how messed up we are we're literally powerless because we're dead and we can't do nothing if we're dead But the very next verse in Ephesians 2, we just read 1 through 3. Paul uses a couple words that are some of those powerful words in Scripture. He says in verse 4, but God. But God is so rich in mercy and he loves us so much that, that even though we were over here and even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. And just in case the church wasn't getting it, just in case we didn't get it, he says it is only by God's grace that you have been saved. He says that it was because of God's mercy, because of his love, that he gave us life, or more like the ability to have life when he raised Jesus from the grave. He built a bridge over here. He built a bridge through sending his son, Jesus, so that we could have the life that he originally designed for his creation. Because he doesn't want to just watch us. Uh, Someone told me a few months ago that they believe God is, is like a human being playing with ants. Just wanting to burn us. Just torturing us. Just messing with us just watching us here's the reason why i know that's not true because god built a bridge for us to have the life that he desired for us anyway and that bridge is jesus paul says it is by grace that we have been saved it is by grace that there is even a bridge an ability for us to make it to the other side And it is grace that precedes salvation that allows us to cross the bridge. So let me talk about prevenient grace and some examples of prevenient grace. And this is not an all-exhaustive 
sermon of, on provident grace, but I hope you will see um, the love that God has for you and how God was at work in your life long before you ever said yes to him. Here's one example of prevenient grace. It's the fact that God calls us. You know, he don't have to call you to follow him. He don't have to say, he don't have to call you by name and ask you to make him his Lord, your Lord and Savior. Instead, what he has done, he has called all of us to repent of our sins, to believe in him, to come to him, to follow him. In fact, John 6, Jesus said, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them, and I will raise them up at the last day. He calls us to act. In fact, the Father is drawing us to himself. He is calling. He's across the bridge, and he's yelling over there. He's calling us by name. He's saying, Nathan, come to me. Follow me. Repent of your sins. Have life that I desired for you in the first place. You know, he calls us in multiple ways. Last week we talked about common grace, and we talked about how God has revealed himself to us. He's revealed himself to us, most importantly, through Jesus. He's also revealed himself to us through Scripture. He reveals us, himself to us by creation. That's one way, though, God calls people. It's by revealing himself. We can actually read the words on the page where Jesus called the disciples to follow him. And the disciples then turned around and they called other people to follow him. And we know that that call is the same call for us today. So he himself calls us into relationship with him. But also he calls us sometimes by sending people. By sending people like you who do follow him. By sending people to preach the gospel message. Romans 10, 14 says this. Paul says, how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they have never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? So sometimes God will send people who love God to tell others about how he has made a way for us to have life. That is one of our, our callings as followers of him, is to make disciples. To bring people into a relationship with him. To share the gospel. I can guarantee you right now, there is someone in your life that needs to hear the gospel message. There was a time where you needed to hear the gospel message. It might have been a preacher on Sunday morning preaching it to you. It might have been your friend. It might have been a complete stranger. But often what God does is he will send people to cross our paths. Who, yes, they tell us the gospel message, but a lot of times they love us. They give us the gospel message by the way they live their lives. I'm thankful for the people in my life who lived out the gospel message, who loved me, who showed me grace and mercy that ultimately pointed me towards God. But you know, sometimes God calls us to himself by allowing situations into our life. Sometimes he blesses us with good things to help us recognize his goodness. But you know, sometimes God allows bad things. God allows bad things to happen so that we hit rock bottom. So that we realize that all the things in the world that are meant to distract us from him, they can't fill us. And we start to look to the one that can. And you might be thinking, you're telling me allowing bad things into my life is God's grace? Yes, it is. Because if he allow something bad in your life and you hit rock bottom and you turn to him, guess what that does? That affects you for eternity. You would much rather suffer for a little while here on earth than to suffer forever in the pits of hell. So yes, it is by God's grace. 
It is an example of prevenient grace, the grace that proceeds when he sometimes allows us to go through a situation. Because often in the middle of that situation, that's when his presence, we sense his presence the most powerful. And we'll get to that in a second. But God will call you. He doesn't have to. He doesn't need us. But he calls us. He's across that bridge calling you over to him because he loves you. That is grace that precedes salvation. But now let's remember what I went through at the beginning of the sermon. He might be calling us. He might be on the other side of the bridge. But we're dead. We can't cross the bridge. You know, I can call and call and call and call the people out of the graves at that cemetery I went to, but they're never coming out of the graves. They will one day, but not by my voice. They're dead. So Jesus is calling us, but we're dead. But you know, I've said this before, I'm going to say it again. God will never call us to do something that he doesn't make possible. And so what God has done as a part of this prevenient grace is that God makes it possible for us to respond to him. God literally frees our will. So let's talk about free will for a little bit. We talk a lot about free will, but when you really think about it, we don't really have free will without God's grace. Because like we just said, we are slaves to our sinful nature. We are slaves to wanting to do wrong. Therefore, we can't choose to do what is right. So what God has done is that he has freed our will so that we can make a decision. He has freed our mind so that we can choose, so that we can choose who we are going to follow. Are we going to continue to follow the ways of this world, or are we going to follow God who desires to give us life? He makes it possible for us to have a choice. So it might actually be better for us to talk less about free will, because often when we talk about free will, we talk about how God doesn't treat us like robots. God doesn't force us to make decisions. But maybe we should actually start talking about freed will. Because God has freed our will. Because if he didn't free our will, we were slaves to doing wrong anyway. But what he has instead done is he has made it, made, he has, through his grace, he has made us able to make a decision to actually do good for him. We can choose to follow him. We didn't have that choice before. Scriptures teach us that we don't have that choice if he didn't give us grace to choose. And so if you have chosen to cross that bridge today, God has made it able for you to cross the bridge. God has freed you up to make that choice. And what I believe is I believe God has freed everybody up to make that choice. I think everybody in this world has freed will. They just have to choose to follow him. The fact that our will is freed means that we're ultimately responsible for the decision we make. We should choose to follow him because if we don't, one decision leads to death. Eternal death. One decision leads to eternal life. So we got a God who, through his grace, he's made a way for us. We're going to talk about saving grace next week on Easter Sunday. I thought that would be appropriate for Easter Sunday. We're going to talk about saving grace, but that's really the bridge. He is over here on the other side of the bridge. He is calling us into a relationship with him. He calls us each by name, telling us to come to him to experience life. And now we have come to the conclusion that he has actually freed us and empowered us to make the decision to cross the bridge. But you know how much God loves you? He loves you so much that he doesn't only call you and empower you, but God pursues you. That's our last example. 
of prevenient grace. We have a God who has come to seek and to save those who are lost. That's what Jesus said in Luke 19, 10. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save those who are lost. He leaves the 99 to find the one because he loves us. So we got a God who's not only created a bridge, we have a God who's crossed the bridge, who's searching for people in this world to follow him, who's calling you into a relationship, who when he allows that bad thing to happen, he says, I'm right here. Here, just open your eyes and see me. Just open your eyes and look at me. I love you so much. Come and follow me. God loves us so much. In our Tuesday table gathering, we're watching the series, The Chosen, and the episode we watched this past week uh, talked about Jesus calling Nathaniel, and the way they portrayed it on there is something really bad had happened in Nathaniel's life, and uh, his friend Philip ultimately said, you know, we found the one, the Messiah. And he ends up coming to meet Jesus. And uh, in John 1, we're told this. He says, how do you know about me? Nathaniel asked Jesus. Jesus replied, I could see you under the fig tree before Philip even found you. We don't know what happened scripturally before Nathaniel followed Jesus. We don't know if something really bad happened, but what we do know is that Jesus was with him, that Jesus saw him under the fig tree before Philip ever found him. It's because we have a God who pursues us. We have a God who crosses the bridge to call us over because he desires for us to have a relationship. I think about the Samaritan woman at the well. Jesus left the crowds he could have kept preaching to the crowds. More people would have been saved. But instead, he chose to go to Samaria, which was like the enemies of the Jews. He chooses to go to Samaria at the middle of the day to go to a well when no one's there. But Jesus, because he is all-powerful, almighty God, he knows that this woman is going to show up to well at that time. And he's pursuing that woman. So he leaves the crowd, he goes to this woman, and he invites her to follow him because he loves her. That's a picture, church, of what he does to each and every person in this world. But how often do we not recognize his presence in our life? How often do we not recognize that he is calling us into relationship with him? And so I want to ask you today, how did God pursue you? Did God put someone in your path? That said the right thing at the right time? Or did God allow you to hit rock bottom to get your attention? And then as soon as he hit rock, as soon as you hit rock bottom, he somehow makes his presence felt in a way that you cannot deny. I bet you we all have stories about how God pursued us. I've shared about my wreck multiple times, but that's probably the time in my life where I most recognize God's pursuit of me. And I was already a follower of him, but at that time I was struggling with him calling me into ministry. And I was driving my bus today, and some of you are going to hear the story again, but I won't share it. I don't have it planned, but this is where God's leading me. I was driving my Mustang. Sarah was actually preaching that morning at um, our church, and... I was trying to make it there. We weren't dating yet, but I was trying to make it there to hear her preach at the early service. And the rain was just pouring down, and I had a, had a Mustang, which if you know anything about Mustangs, they're not great um, uh, in rain. Which, by the way, my dad drove his Mustang, his old Mustang, 60-something Mustang uh, out there. Um, and I was flying up 74, 73. It wasn't flying. I was actually going probably 55, but the rain was just coming down. And I was listening to the song Cornerstone. We sang that a couple weeks ago. And um, next thing I know, I've lost control. Car is spinning, heading over to, to a bunch of trees. Um, and all I can think about, because you know when a, when a wreck happens, everything kind of goes slow motion. 
All I could think about was the lyrics to the song Cornerstone. Through the storm, he is Lord, Lord of all. Here I was in the middle of a literal rainstorm. Here I was in the middle of a life-threatening storm in my life. Yet through all of that, God's presence had me at peace. Because I knew he was in the car with me. So my car went. Next thing I know, car's upside down. I had hit a, a ditch, a ditch dropped off, and um, I ran into the side of the bank, and then my car flipped over. And, you know, I checked everything. I was fine, and uh, I was upside down, though, so I unbuckled my seat belt, and I fell down to the ground, and then I got out, and a couple people had stopped, and they asked me if I was okay, and, of course, you know, I said I was okay. I only had a little scratch on my hand from the airbag that deployed. My car filled up with water. If I was unconscious and those people didn't stop, I probably would have died that day. Because it was raining so hard and my, my car was, was, there was a drainage pipe there, and my car was blocking that water from being able to drain. And so my car, cab, just fell, filled up with water. And I was, would have been hanging upside down, so it wouldn't have take, taken long for me to have uh, drowned. But God, through his grace, the grace that preceded my answer to call in ministry. God, through his grace, pursued me. You know, I had my Bible sitting on the dashboard. Think about it. My car's upside down. Water's filling up the cab. Water was up to, to the steering wheel. I mean, it, the whole radio and everything was just, everything electrical was ruined in there because of the water. You know, my Bible was not damaged at all. My Bible had glass shards inside of it from where the windshield busted. I made it out fine. My Bible made it out fine. And all I could think about in the middle of the wreck was through the storm, he is Lord, Lord of all. God was pursuing me. Not exactly how we're talking about today in terms of preceding salvation, but it preceded my answer to the call of the ministry. It preceded my act of obedience to him. I could feel his love. I knew his love. In that moment, in ways that I never had before. And I wonder if you're here today, and you look back on your life and you can recognize a time in your life where God pursued you. Where God made his presence felt in your life in such a powerful way that you could only say yes. Doesn't that make you feel loved? That the God of the universe, he doesn't treat us like little ants. He's a God that desires a relationship with us. He pursued you. And he pursued you because he loved you. I'm going to invite the worship team to come back up here. And I want us to sing that hymn again. Love lifted me. And I hope that as we sing it again, I hope you sing it with a little bit different perspective. Love really did lift you because you couldn't lift yourself. In fact, we know based off the scriptures that we've read that you were dead. You were powerless. And God, through his love and his mercy and his grace, he lifted you. The first verse of that song says, I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore. Very deeply stained within, that's the original sin, sinking to rise no more. So we were sinking deep in sin, we were far from the peaceful shore, we were deeply stained. We couldn't even get ourselves out. We were so messed up that we were hopeless. But, 
This is where grace comes in. The next part of that verse says, But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry, and from the waters he lifted me, now safe am I. The chorus says, love lifted me. Love lifted me. When nothing else could help, including yourself, love lifted you. I hope today that if you don't know that love, that today you would come to know the love of God. That you would know he's pursuing you right now. He has made a way for you to cross that bridge. He's calling you. He's empowered you to respond through his love. And he's pursuing you. But maybe you are here today and you know that God saved you. But maybe before today you didn't know the lengths that God went to save you. How far he went because he loved you. How much his power was at work in your life. Just so that you could have a relationship with him. And so here's my prayer for you today. And this is the same prayer that Paul prayed over the Ephesian church. I pray that out of his glorious riches that he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure, to all the fullness of God. God, we ask that you would make that happen today. As we sing about how your love has lifted us, Father, I pray that we would respond in worship and obedience to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.